I do not know why this game exists. I'm not saying I wish it didn't. I'm just very confused. The Misadventures of Tron Bon, a spin-off companion title to Mega Man Legends starring the Bon pirate family, the secondary antagonists from the rest of the series, uh, well, the other two games. Immediately, my thoughts drifted to, huh? The Bonds are fun characters who bring a lot of humor and personality to the Legends games, but a whole story just about them. And not even the whole family, pretty much just Tron specifically. Despite its genuinely good qualities, ambitiousness, and cult following, by most accounts Mega Man Legends didn't perform great. That is to say, it performed around the same as any of the other PS1 Mega Man games that released around that time. About 400,000 to 500,000 units sold depending on where you check. Now while at first that might sound pretty good, and in a vacuum it is, we gotta take some other factors into account. For starters, these numbers still put Legends back behind nearly anything else AAA Capcom was putting out at the time on PlayStation. Games like Resident Evil and Dino Crisis were selling well into the millions, many times higher than any Mega Man game in general. This series has never really sold well. Also remember that Mega Man Legends is a fully 3D title in what, at the time, was a brand new type of open adventure game, with fully interconnected levels, tons of modeled cutscenes, side quests, world building, and voice acting. Mega Man 8 looks like a prettied up SNES game and has like three outsourced anime cutscenes. Considering the amount of resources and effort that must have went into Legends, it just can't be selling the same as or worse than your standard three hour long 2D platformer with an easy to replicate basic formula. Well, it can't still sell worse than that and be a good worthwhile return on investment. The series was canceled for a reason, as much as it sucks to say. A sequel to Legends would release about three to four years later, and while I can understand giving a game that sold okay another chance, why would you spend funds and work hours on a side game featuring a side character? Imagine if they made an RTS base building game about Pandora and Prometheus from Mega Man ZX. I, sure, I mean, it might be good, but why would you make a spin-off of a game that sold poorly about the secondary villains in a different genre and style? I guess it just goes to show how much more willing to take risks game companies were back then. New titles are so expensive to produce nowadays that developers can't risk tens of millions of dollars on a complete gamble project like Tronbon. And they're right, because Tronbon is a gamble that failed spectacularly, by the way. From my research, Misadventures is consistently placed at selling less than 100,000 units worldwide, with the majority of those being sold in Japan. I hate to take y'all back here, but you gotta remember, on top of Legends itself not exactly being a smash hit. This was gaming in the 90s. You couldn't possibly convince a young boy in the West to purchase a game with a girl wearing pink as the main character. It's wrong and ridiculous, but that's how things were. Also, the, the box art is just really bad. Why are so many of the Legends box arts just fucking bad? The bottom line is that The Misadventures of Tronbon is one of the worst selling games Capcom has put out. Lower than even infamous stinkers like X6. And because of that, it is impossibly rare, with English copies being among the rarest commercially released games of all time. But is that how things should have went? Should Tronbon have been cast out and burned in the pits of obscurity? What even is this game, really? I've never played it myself, and I've never watched a review on it or anything, so I guess we'll have to find out together. The Misadventures of Tronbon! To get the full backstory on this plot, you'll have to sit on the title screen for a bit until you're shown, uh, oh, portraits. This is how the majority of the narrative is delivered in Misadventures. Character busts and speech bubbles with the very occasional 3D animated cutscene. Thankfully, the game is fully voiced to make up for this. I do understand why it was done. The game is a spin-off and very dialogue heavy. It would be time consuming and expensive to animate and manage facial expressions for all of these conversations. Plus, most of the scenes would just be two characters talking to each other while standing still anyway. I can deal with this. I'm used to games with tons of dialogue and no voice acting around here, so this is a step up. The only voice acting oddity that threw me off was Bon. And I'm not a massive Legends fan or anything, but even I recognize that Bon's voice is wrong. In this game, and only this game of the trilogy, they had an English voice actor dub over Bond's simple noises. It sounds less like a small child and more like a grown man just saying, No disrespect to the voice actor themselves, it's just a strange direction choice for a character who basically doesn't speak at all. The story begins with the Bond pirates finishing construction on their airship headquarters, the Gesselschaft. 
or Gesellschaft. I, it's clearly supposed to be German in some way. So I feel like it should be Gesellschaft, but the characters say Gesellschaft. So I, I don't know. I'll probably just go back and forth between whatever. While built mostly by Tron and the Serve bots, the supplies to construct the Gesellschaft were only purchasable thanks to a massive loan Tiesel borrowed from infamous business tycoon Lex Loth. You may have picked up that since this plot takes place right after the Gesellschaft's construction and you blow it to high hell in Mega Man Legends, Misadventures takes place right before Legends, and barring a small optional cameo, Volna and the others don't appear at all, so don't expect to be seeing them. To repay his debt, Tiesel heads to a desert ruin supposedly filled with treasure, and we're dropped immediately into the gameplay. We'll talk controls and structure and all that in a few minutes. Let's focus on the rest of the setup for now. Don't worry about a thing. We'll be home with the treasure before you, huh? What's that? You're a hard man to find, Tiefel Ball. Don't you recognize me? I'm hurt. It's me, Glide. I work for Mr. Glide, remember? I don't know why I've come all this way to find you. What the fuck? What the fuck are those? <laughs> all right, all right, I'm okay. I'm okay. As the game says, this charming fellow is Glide, the right hand collecting debts for the Loath family. Teasel is now arbitrarily late, returning the boss's million smackaroos, so they take him and the small child to be their slaves until the money is repaid. Something's definitely not right about this whole situation, but Tron's gonna need to collect that million zenny herself now either way. Misadventures is a non-linear affair wherein you visit various locations around Ryship Island to perform independent multi-step heists to accumulate the million bucks you need to buy your brother's Ziz's freedom, with each mission set having a separate gameplay style. Every level has its base earnings value alongside a variety of optional objectives to scrounge up some extra funds on the side. Before heading out for any missions though, you'll have to prepare the serve bots and your equipment on the gazelle shaft. From headquarters, you can visit an expanding collection of rooms and offices that offer different services or are just there to hang out with you boys. It feels like things are always happening on the ship, even when you aren't there. We'll talk about some more specific rooms when they become relevant. There's not much you can do here at the start with no money, no resources, and half the areas of the ship aren't even finished yet. So let's go straight into the meeting room to set out on some missions and change that. Action type missions feature a character, usually Tron herself, piloting the Gustav, a humanoid mech with a buster cannon and the ability to lift large objects. If you've had experiences similar to mine, you're probably more familiar with the latter appearances of the Gustav present in various Capcom crossover games. There, it's usually painted green and given an exposed cockpit. In Misadventures, it's instead tinted red by default and the top is always sealed. The action missions are the part of the game that plays most like Mega Man Legends itself. I'm actually surprised surprised this is here because everything I've heard about this game for years implied it was some kind of mini game heavy puzzle thing, so I sort of just ignored it all this time. Like the few Mega Man things I haven't experienced though, ever since this channel took off, I've purposefully never watched a video or review or any such content about this game in case I ever did decide to cover it. There's still no analog support for this game, so the control scheme is identical to Legends 1 for the most part. You move and strafe with a combination of the D-pad and triggers, hold down L2 to stand in place and lock onto targets. There's also a new automatic shooting mode that does the lock on for you, which I understand adding in considering that some people struggled with the first game's awkward switching between movement, aiming, and shooting. Speaking of the first game, Volna was very quick with instant acceleration and mostly small narrow stages, and it made the controls a bit stiff and jittery when you were just learning how to play. Often the camera would get stuck on walls or it'd be difficult to make small adjustments. The key difference here with the Gustav is that you move slightly slower in general, and the stages tend to be more open and slower paced than the aggressive, fast enemy laden narrow tunnels of the underground. The controls in game feels still don't hit their peak until the next game, but these incremental changes are good for now. The new mechanic tossed atop the circle strafing and shooting are the serve bots. We didn't really talk about these small 
Lego fellas before, because all things considered, they don't play much of a part in Legend's admittedly short runtime. Certainly not enough to be the series mascot and appear in like a billion Capcom games afterwards. They become far more prevalent and fleshed out here. During action stages, a squad of six serve bots can be deployed with a beacon bomb that orders them where to focus their attention. Now, their performance at that point depends on where you're sending them and their stats. You can send them into homes to steal valuables, have them swarm enemies, stop obstacles, break things. I fucking lost it when I sent them after a police car expecting them to destroy it, only for them to strip the car for parts and then run away. There are 41 serve bots that each go by a number, though you can give them individual nicknames. This isn't only gameplay, but as a matter of lore. All of them were created by Tron, barring one? He's a bonus from a Japanese gaming magazine or something? He, he's a little fucking weirdo, and he ain't in the English version anyway. Anywho, being their creator, the Servbots kinda look at Tron as their mother, and are eager to help with the Bond's crimes to try and please her. Unfortunately, most of them are clumsy, cowardly, or just not very bright, but we can fix that. Servbots each have their own personality and stats that govern things like their strength and speed, alongside a potential skill that will make them even better in certain situations, or allow them to help with special operations on the Gesellschaft. I'm not really gonna do a big breakdown on raising the serve bots. See, truthfully, these stats don't really matter much. Not to say the stats don't change anything, it's just that Misadventures is not a very difficult game, and only a third of it even involves combat or situations where you're in any danger of failing. It's a commendably complex sort of pet raising system that you could spend hours messing with, but it is also almost completely optional as the game itself doesn't really require interacting with it. So let's interact with it! To raise Servbot's magic numbers, you've got two main options. The first is a carnival-style ball-throwing minigame that gives me horrific flashbacks to Swanky's bootleg sideshow from Donkey Kong Country 3. The score window is oddly tight for a minigame that only upgrades a single stat point on a single Servbot. You have to return the bombs that are thrown to you, and there are two things you need to realize or this thing is just impossible. One, you can catch the bombs in mid-air by pressing grab at the right moment, and two, you can hit a pair of targets together if you have perfect aim. It's still tough even with these tips, but it's not like it costs anything to retry. The other minigame is a sort of quick time event where you have to man the mess hall by checking the menu combinations to serve food. Wait, these guys eat? Can somebody explain? How you know, actually don't. There's probably some very detailed fan art about servebot digestion. I don't, I don't want to say it. Beyond the stat management, in an unexpected level of detail, you can talk to and interact with all of the serve bots individually. They have their own little conversations, and you can even give them items based on their personalities to unlock special skills, mostly allowing them to create more upgrades for the Bond family's various robots. Things like extra weapons, better armor, or a paint set that allows you to change the Gustav's appearance. There is a tiny problem here, and it's that the game has no intention of telling you how to use any of this stuff. Passive upgrades like energy increases and armor go on automatically, it seems, but the weapons can be more irritating. There's only two of them, so it's not a huge deal. See, you select to build a weapon from the development menu, and then nothing happens. The game tells you that you should be able to change weapons on the mission screen, but that just didn't seem to ever do anything no matter how many attempts I made. This is because even though every single thing in the universe would imply to you that crafting the weapon parts for the Gustav would give you the weapon parts for the Gustav, that is not the case. You still need more parts for the weapons in addition to another giant chunk of funds to create them by giving all the resources to a specific serve bot. So to create the Gatling gun, you need the parts from the development tab alongside what the game calls a rapid fire trigger. This is not an item in the game. There is no collectible that even comes close to this name. You have to figure out that the game is referring to a bundle of fireworks you can obtain from one of the missions because they're designed to go off in a sequence. This is the reasoning that the serve bot gives you. There's probably so much optional stuff discovered this way that I'm positive there's plenty of other unlockables and extras and secret stuff that I entirely missed. Obtuse upgrades aside, all this extra flavor for the serve bots in the world of legends should be a good thing, and it absolutely is. There's so many little details and cute interactions here, but playing this in 2024, the more I get invested in this universe and its characters and see how much effort was put in, the more enraged I become that this franchise is now forever dead.
Back at the shooting, the main storyline of the action mission sees Tron robbing a town of its valuables to pawn them off, the primary objective being the bank, while butting heads with police officer Denise Marmalade. She is absolutely miserable and constantly a stuttering mess one slip up away from being fired, even though she's capable of hurricane tossing the serve bots and flipping the fucking Gustav barehanded. Damn. Look, anyone can be out here rooting for a girl boss, but we stand girl failures around here. Just absolutely adorable fuck-ups. Even Tron starts feeling bad for her by the end of the quest line. Captain! Uh, yes, ma'am! Yes, ma'am! I'm sorry, ma'am! Hmm. Looks like she's in a lot of trouble. I feel kind of sorry for her. Miss Tron, we got everything. Let's go home! I'm sorry, but I've got my own problems to worry about. Good luck, officer! The puzzle stages have no continuous story tying them together, simply seeing Tron and the gang stealing dozens of completely unprotected shipping containers to hawk all the goodies inside. These are grid-based block puzzles that are somewhat similar to sliding tile challenges, but while I would cast every slide puzzle into the fires of the damned with no reservation, I was actually a fan of Misadventure's approach to the concept. The goal is to move four green supply crates, and optionally a fifth bonus crate, back to the boat for pirate-adjacent criminal missions. You can hoist crates above your head to move them around, and leap on top of other crates to get past, but the jump has no distance and can't be used to cross gaps. The Gustav isn't designed to be manhandling five tons of steel and meat around all day, unlike me ladies. So there are limitations. The Gustav can only perform a set number of lifts for each stage, and can only move ten panels from the initial pickup spot. The game usually gives you the exact number of moves you need to finish the board and its bonus objective. Off the top of my head, it also never required you to move a crate, then move that same crate again with a second lift, so no need to consider that possibility when solution searching. I did really enjoy these stages, there just isn't much for me to say about them. Oh, also, if you are going for the optional crates, you have to make absolutely sure to snatch up the extra supplies before the main objective is finished, or the mission will automatically complete and you'll have to redo the entire puzzle. I did this more than once. All right, this is where my opinions might get a little dicey. The RPG missions are first-person dungeon crawlers, a la things like Wizardry and other old-school PC games. You take remote control of the Finkel, a small flying pig sort of robot, accompanied by three serve bots. This is actually a pretty smart idea for stages like this. You can eliminate any camera or movement issues from navigating narrow spaces by turning the player into a floating first-person drone. The only action the Finkel itself is capable of is a little dash you can use to break weak objects. The serve bots have to do the rest, using beacon bombs to point them to press switches and investigating for treasure. The main aspect of these RPG stages is talking to the other diggers going around the underground searching for riches. Some of them just give you advice, some of them just tell you to fuck off, some of them require your assistance, and others become recurring characters who have their own little mini arcs. I like this idea a lot. Some of these guys have fun personalities and cool designs. They're they're definitely the highlight of these missions, it's just a shame that they're stuck in these mind-numbing cave levels. Outside of the little character-related side stories, the main thread of the RPG missions, which carries through its various levels, is finding large refractor crystals called Aurora Stones, as well as the fabled Elixir of Life, rumored to be somewhere deep in the ruins of the Old World. There's a hidden stone in each of the three RPG levels that can all be combined in the last stage, so you need to make sure to pick them up as you go if you want to get the secret reward. You can't revisit stages. What is the Elixir of Life? Well. I'm not gonna spoil that one, actually. I think it's a lot more interesting if you put in the effort and figure it out for yourself. Everything being laid out now, I have to say that these missions drag. 
They take the longest by far and have the least interactivity. After the first level, you've seen everything this gameplay style has to offer, but you'll be expected to do it twice more in stages that are both decently more complex and lengthy. I think the addition of maybe some kind of very basic shooting mechanic, or perhaps some more complex puzzles would have been in order here. Because as it stands, they're more like point and click visual novels rather than a typical dungeon crawler. A charming little visual novel for sure, but there's really not much going on in terms of raw gameplay here. The few combat encounters that do exist mostly consist of you fighting these exact same little floating eyeball guys over and over and over again. The game will just constantly lock you in a small room and expect you to pinball them all around until they're dead. I mean, they're not offensively bad, and there are less RPG stages than any other kind of stage in the game. But by stage three, I was just waiting to go back to one of the other two gameplay styles. If I ever replayed the game, I would absolutely skip these and just get more money from the other stages instead. We did it! We finally got a million zenny! That means we can finally bring Teasel and Bon Bon back home! Regardless of how many stages you've completed, or what stages you've completed, once you're holding onto one million zenny at a given time, Tron and the Servbots will head out to repay their loan. Well, 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 what have we here? A pretty young girl. Quite a strong-willed one, too. You know why I'm here. I've come for my brother! <laughs> Just the one? There. The debt's been settled. Give me back my brother. Let's see. 10, 20, 30. Mm, looks a little short to me. What are you talking about? There's a million zenny right there. Yes, there is. But there's this little thing called interest. Let's see. With this much, hmm. I need another 2 million zenny. Wh what? So yes, as this pointy nose prick said, we're gonna need another two million zenny to pay off the debt. At this point in the story, the recon team will inform Tron of more money-making opportunities they've uncovered, and it opens up a few more missions. The puzzle stages are just more puzzle stages with the same theme and everything, though they do feature the sought-after ability to make your serve bots forklift certified. This allows for more complex layouts where you use all of your lifts to move obstacles and allow the serve bots to bring the crates back to the ship. These can get pretty tricky. There are some of these I was stumped on for like a half hour. It's very important that you realize it's possible to order the forklift while holding a container. Some of the puzzles are not possible until you realize this. Like I said, these can get pretty tricky, but it's nice to have video game puzzles that actually make you think for a bit instead of press these three buttons in order because you read a note somewhere else. No problems here, but the action stages, uh, so we go from robbing a bank and blowing up the police to stealing piggies from a farm. <laughs> And this is some kind of weird Joker reference, I do not get it. These stages are not fun, but not because they're bad, because they're on a farm. Take it from someone who's lived in smack dab center of Nowheresville his entire life. A farm makes for a shitty video game stage. If your brain is spinning up right now and asking, hey, wouldn't a farm based stage just be a big empty field? Yes. Yes, it would be. There's no level design here. It's just big empty patches of grass where you escort surf bots back to the truck to haul off livestock. Yeah, it's also an escort mission. These are simply bizarre. I have no clue what the idea was here. Maybe these were originally the first set of missions, but they were deemed not exciting enough for the start of the game. I, I don't know. If you still haven't, this is also the point where I suggest you to go check out the ruins. The Nikai ruins from the start of the game are actually the only area you're allowed to return to indefinitely, and this stage is the closest to a Mega Man Legends dungeon you'll find here. It's filled with reaver bots, secret paths, and mini bosses containing tons of refractors and parts for the alternate weapons. Since missions cannot be replayed, as I've said multiple times, the ruins is where the game throws you a little bit of leeway. It appears that the enemies in the ruins will respawn an infinite amount of times once you leave, so I would imagine it is technically possible for someone with unbreakable patience and a thirst for boredom to clear the entire game with only the ruins stage. Which I think would actually create a bit of a problem, since Denise is mentioned in the ending and Tron would never have met her if you never played the action missions. The ruins was easily my favorite stage in the game, but as I said, it's because it's the stage that most reminds me of the original. 
From all of this steel and uh, fortune hunting, you're also likely sitting on dozens and dozens of collected valuables that you haven't done anything with. See, the items the serve bots collect that aren't mission vital are not automatically converted to profit. You'll have to manually sell them from the gazelle shaft. Now, it's hard, if not impossible, to tell what's junk for cash and what is an important item to unlock a serve bot ability just from the name of the object. But thankfully, in a quality of life feature that every game ever should have, the game will explicitly tell you if an item has some sort of use or can be sold with no hesitation. Steal enough cows and sell enough shit and we can finally, once again, attempt to pay back our loan to Loathe. So, do you have my money? Of course! Here it is! Now give me back my brothers! Hmm. Is this all there is? You're short, Missy. How many days do you think it's been since we last met? You owe interest on your interest. You, you. Tron and her accompanying serve bots are captured and tossed into Loth's prison camp, where they happen to end up alongside Teasel and Bon. After reuniting, Teasel explains that none of this mess was ever about the money. Loth just knew that Teasel was a treasure-seeking pirate and would be able to help him find the Colossus, a towering reaver bot powered by an enormous gold refractor that is located somewhere in the ruins. Of course, that doesn't change the fact that the entire Bon family is locked up now, but Tron, in a 4 million IQ play, expects did Loth would try to pull some shit like this, and signals for the remaining serve bots on the ship to take the goose off and come rescue them. Fighting the same enemy layout multiple times while blowing up doors ensues. The Bonds and the serve bots plan it to jack all of Loth's shit on the way out, and stumble across the still unawakened Colossus by accident. Glide and his awful little bird goons try to stop them, but holding R1 is simply too powerful for him to handle. However, you'd have to be brain dead to think we're leaving this place without shooting a giant robot. The big boys powered up and the Bonds escape a deep underground facility in mere seconds without being crushed. Phew, that was a close one. I don't even remember how we got out. <laughs> okay, that, that was funny, I forgive you. As Loth attacks, Teasel is knocked overboard and Tron is... Oh, oh, fuck, she's really messed up. If only there was a brave group of seven mini figs who could step up and save the day. Everybody? All right, our target is the Colossus's head. Let's get him! Roger! Thankfully, we don't have to fight the entire Colossus so much as just bopping its head a few times. Using the throw that you might have forgotten that you even had because you don't ever really need to use it, the bots rip out all the power conduits generating a shield around the core. Then when it's time to fight off the head itself, you better be real fucking careful. The patterns aren't particularly cheesy or unfair or anything like that, but the attacks are strong, even with armor upgrades. Bring your best boys and craft a butt load of healing items before coming in for this one. The whole thing sort of had a Breath of the Wild vibe to it now that I think about it. You can get to the game's ending ignoring all the main content and upgrades as a sort of challenge run if you wanted. Just play through the ruins a million times. It does add a sort of custom difficulty for a game that is probably a little on the easy side. Loath is defeated, his robo-slave is destroyed, and his family is presumably dissolved since the Bonds yoinked all their assets. Tron turns the pair in anonymously to the police, sneakily securing Denise's continued employment that the Bonds had previously jeopardized by blowing up and robbing the bank. Twice. The whole family returns home with the spoils of war and waits patiently for a 14-year-old blue fuck to blow up all their stuff. So definitely a shorter video this time, but overall I thought The Misadventures of Tron Bon was pretty good. In comparison to Mega Man Legends, I would say that Tron is more refined and varied on a technical and design level, but I personally prefer Legends. Misadventures puts in work to tweak problems like the controls and camera, while also adding some extra gameplay styles and providing a longer experience compared to Legend 1's very short runtime. On the other hand, while it maintains the charm, graphics, and catchy soundtrack of its predecessor, it loses my favorite aspect. 
the exploration. There is no hub world, and most of the stages are completely linear and self-contained, barring the ruins, which takes 20 minutes tops to pick fully clean. The upgrades for the Gustav are also way more limited in function and number than Mega Man's enhancements like the jump boots or air skates. The puzzles are a nice compromise for additional depth, but the RPG stages are basically just point and click hallways where you sometimes slam your face into some floaty robots over and over, while talking to some friendly folks too, I suppose. Really, the best part of this game is all the interactions between the Bond family, including the surf bots, of course, and it feels like this was the main driving force behind the game. Still, I will certainly be going into Mega Man Legends 2 with a better idea of these goobers and what they're all about, and knowing that this world is that tiny bit more fleshed out. Maybe I'll even feel a little worse when I'm inevitably shooting at them, you know? But going over everything at the end here, there's still one thing I'm wondering. If the Bonds got this huge legendary gold refractor and all of Lowe's expensive stuff, why are they still so desperate for more money in Mega Man Legends? Thank you! I know you're a hard worker! Like today, for instance. You were working trash detail, right? It was tough! That pile of junk in the storage room was really heavy for some reason. Of course, you left alone the treasure box that the gold refractor was in, right? Huh? I threw out everything in the storage room. <laughs>